Hello? Is my mic on? Hey. Uh, as people are trickling in, uh, I think we, uh, we're at 9.47 here, so we may as well get things started. I know here at SOCAP, uh, particularly in these morning sessions, there's a little bit of a uh, laissez-faire attitude to when they start. Um, so I assume we'll add audience as we go, but uh, let's get going. Uh, my name is Ruben Teg. Uh, I am with Prudential. Uh, I work in our uh, impact investments group. Um, I lead the real estate investing practice there, um, and uh, Prudential uh, has about a $1 billion uh, uh, impact investments portfolio. Real estate comprises about half of that, um, and in that uh, real estate portfolio, uh, we have a pretty uh, broad range of partners across uh, geographies and uh, product types. Um, but uh, one of the reasons that uh, we're sponsoring this track, this racial diversity track across SOCAP this year, um, is that we do not feel like we have sufficient partner diversity uh, for our uh, investments. And particularly, that is true uh, in the world of real estate. Um, and that has been painful and uncomfortable for me for some years now. Uh, and I think that uh, you know this panel is reflective of the steps that we are trying to take to figure out uh, how we can address that and do a better job um, with bringing in a representative uh, series of partners for, for our deals. Um, we have great panelists here today to talk about the issue of racial diversity in real estate. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves to you and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, how they got here. Um, and then I'm hoping we can have a good conversation about uh, you know, where people aren't succeeding necessarily in breaking through some of the barriers in the industry, where those barriers are, what institutions like Prudential can do uh, to address those barriers, um, and uh, what people who are here at SOCAP can do in order to uh, help break some of those barriers down and overcome the uh, just very obvious disparity in terms of outcomes in the industry. Um, to that point, I've got a few statistics just I wanted to use to set the scene. Um, you know, in the United States, a century ago, there was a 30% gap in home ownership, just starting at the basic home ownership level uh, between uh, African Americans and whites. You had about a 50% home ownership rate among white people and about 20% among African Americans. Today, uh, home ownership rates have gone up. But that 30% gap is still there. We're at about 70% for white people and about 40% for African Americans. So even though home ownership as a society has increased, we are actually amazingly retaining the exact same gap that we had 100 years ago, um, which is, I, to me, that I find that shocking. And then you move up from there into the real estate industry itself. So you know, home ownership is one way to build wealth. Um, another way is to be a participant in an industry that is a massive wealth generator in the United States. Um, but if you look out across the real estate industry um, using e EEOC data, uh, something like 2.5% of all senior positions in all real estate firms are held by African Americans relative to about, you know, I think 12% of the population. Um, and then when you, uh, when you drill down even further into asset managers in real estate, we're talking about something like one to one and a half percent of total AUM is managed by African Americans. And that is, you know, it's quite striking. Obviously, it's way out of line with where we are as a society. It's also out of line, as it turns out, with other professions. I mean, even if you, you know, if you look out at, for example, law firms, which are no, you know, th th there's not a perfect story to be told there in the legal industry, but even there, you know, 15% uh, of major law firm lawyers are African American and about 9% of partners are. So, you know, that's an industry that has made real strides while I think the real estate industry has in many ways remained relatively stagnant. Um, and I think that's sort of what I'd like to explore today, why that is and, and what we can do about it. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. I'm going to uh, just turn it over, David. I'll start with you because you're next to me. Um, and I would just love it if each of you could give, uh, you know, a short bio of yourselves and, uh, and then we'll dig in with some questions. Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Dave Bramble. That says Yard 56. That's because that's a project that we did with Prudential. Um, MCB Real Estate is the name of our, our company. Um, we're based in Baltimore. 
um, and we do retail, industrial, office, and mixed use up and down the East Coast. Um, so we are an uh, operator, and we typically raise capital from institutional investors um, to do transactions, um, uh, either specific transactions or a series of transactions or you know, joint ventures, that kind of thing. Um, we, uh, I founded the company with my partner, I guess, about uh, uh, 12 years ago. Um, and we started off very small, like a lot of uh, groups do, doing small deals and then progressing to doing bigger deals. Um, and now our portfolio is 8 million feet, have about 2 million feet under construction, total value of a little over a billion dollars. Um, and uh, we manage capital for many of the, the largest uh, uh, institutions in the country, including New York Common, uh, New York City, Illinois Municipal, Prudential, and lots of big private equity firms too. Um, so uh, the you know our path was very sort of typical from you know from a small operator raising money from high net worth investors to growing to raising money from from large investors. Um, so that's sort of you know that's sort of my story. Hello. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate on the panel. Uh, my name is Pamela West. I am with Nuveen, which is an asset manager for TIA. It uh, used to be CREF. Now we're just TIAA. I've been there for 12 years and um, started out on the traditional real estate side. And now I, um, I'm focused on the impact investing uh, team here, uh, in, well, not here, but in New York. And um, our portfolio is about a billion dollars. We focus on um, global private equity as well as affordable housing domestically. And a lot of what we do is focus on healthcare and education. Um, and I specifically focus on the housing side. And we have a dual strategy of investing in funds as well as direct deals. Um, and I joined the team um, officially about a year ago, and Daryl will tell you he's uh, one of our um, uh, investment uh, fund managers, and um, I think you're the second largest um, <laughs> fund manager that we have wow. on the um, affordable housing side. Uh, and, and so a, a lot of what we do is focus on planet and people, uh, and uh, we have also a resource efficiency um, strategy that focuses on um, finding uh, investments that, that take materials and turn them into something better um, for the environment. Good morning, my name is James Walls. I am with the Annie E. Casey Foundation based in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I sit on the social investments team at Casey. Um, the mission of Casey is to build a brighter future for all children, um, especially children of color um, and also low-income children. Um, so we have a very broad mandate, so therefore our teams are very broad. Um, so we have national teams that focus on children in the system, for example, so our child welfare um, team, our juvenile justice team. We also have place-based strategies in Baltimore and Atlanta. Um, and so we go through a variety of, of impact verticals um, on, on our team. But right now we're um, concentrating on affordable housing, um, quality affordable housing. Uh, quality job creation, and then closing the racial wealth gap are our three priorities for the social investments team. Um, the foundation's endowment is $2.7 billion, and we manage our carve-out of that endowment. Good morning. I'm Daryl Carter. I am the founder and CEO of Avana Capital Management. Uh, we own and operate about 11,000 apartment units in about 72 communities uh, around the, the U.S. We're in 12 states, primarily on the two coasts. Uh, I'm based in Southern California. Um, this is the second company that I'm building in, in the commercial real estate sector, and, and um, diversity is extremely important. And I probably got my first lesson in diversity uh, as a young banking uh, analyst uh, in, at Continental Illinois Bank in Chicago uh, in the early 80s, and I know many of you uh, were not born by, at that time. Um, but I remember being asked by one of my bosses, who was a, uh, a woman, who to go look at a, a property in, in St. Louis, and, she, and when I came back, she said, well, what did you think? And I said, it's nice. And she said, well, did you feel safe there? And I said, yeah, I felt safe. 
And then she pointed out, Daryl, you're black, you're six foot eight, 250 pounds, you grew up on the west side of Detroit, you played uh, sports in the Big Ten, you know, like you're probably safe most places. <laughs> I'm five foot white and 100 pounds, and how would I feel there? And I'm like, ooh, that's a good point. And, and ever since that early lesson, I learned the importance of diversity, uh, not just because it's the right thing, but people have different perspectives. And when you're in the investment business, you know, you want to make sure you're not missing things by your own biases. And, you know, it's not an issue of whether they're black, white, whatever biases, but everyone has biases. And it's important to reflect, uh, have an investment team that is, has different views and, and different opinions. Uh, so anyway, I think it's a great panel, and, and uh, I thank SOCAP for putting this on. Great. Uh, so I think I'd, I'd like to start sort of at the, at the base of the talent pyramid. And um, the question I have is, you know, at, at the sort of entry level into the real estate industry, um, whether that's real estate brokerage or um, analyst type positions or junior positions at a bank, um, you know, where are the barriers or what are the reasons that you don't see more people of color kind of coming in at that level? Or what are the things that could be done that would increase the number of people kind of coming into the talent uh, pathway? And I'll, I'll throw that out there for whoever wants to take it. Uh, if nobody does, David, I'm going to pick you to go first. <laughs> All right. I don't mind being picked. Um, <clears throat> I think that, I mean, I think the biggest challenge is, you know, I, for, and I think you sort of got to break it down. There's lots of pathways into things like residential sales, right? Because there are other, and, and, and I'm speaking from an African-American perspective, and uh, I think also, I, you know, there is a, there's lots of people that look like you who do that. You're comfortable talking to them saying, how do I get into this business? And then you, you know, you get opportunities to do it. It has a very low startup cost, and then you can do it. Um, I think um, when you talk about coming into the institutional space, um, I think it's extremely difficult because the, the pathways that are sort of designated basically come through fancy business schools and uh, things like that. And if you're not sort of on those tracks or you don't have those relationships, uh, it's very difficult to get those jobs, right? To get that first analyst job at a big public company, big public real estate company, or a big real estate asset manager is virtually impossible without a relationship, um, or unless you're coming with a, you know, sort of the resume opportunity. Sort of, I have the resume for this job. Um, so I think that uh, that that's the biggest barrier to entry, sort of, for the operating guys, and then for the for the entrepreneurial side of real estate. The, the biggest barrier is capital. Like you can't really be a real estate uh, investor unless you can either raise money or get money or you have some way to sort of get started in the business. So you add all those things up and it becomes very difficult um, to sort of break into the industry. That's why this conversation is so important because um, as we get more senior professionals, more uh, senior uh, female and more senior minority professionals, we have to be intentional about creating pathways for people who otherwise wouldn't have access to sit down and talk to somebody about, well, how do I get from, you know, flipping two houses to buying an office building? Like, what's that step? And, you know, how do I create those opportunities? So uh, that's sort of my sense of it. I would say there's something else that, and we have incredible diversity throughout our, our organization in every area. And why is that? I mean, what, one of the fascinating things that happens is that many of the, 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 I have friends, you know, I've been in the industry for 38 years who are CEOs of REITs and other types of companies. And, you know, one, one uh, gentleman in, in particular uh, who you might know, Saul, who is a senior in our acquisition team. Well, this African-American, he had worked five years at another company doing due diligence and underwriting. He wanted to do acquisitions where he's on the front line of, of, of marketing. He left that company. Now, this is a, a young man who graduated from Brown University. He then went to and got his MBA at the University of Wisconsin. Very, very good school. He comes back, and he wants to go back to this company, potentially on the acquisition side. So the CEO of the company 
and this is, I've had this happen a dozen times, calls me and says, would you talk to Saul? Um, you know, cause Saul wants to do acquisitions and I'm not sure and everything. So then, of course, I happened to talk to Saul. I met him and I'm like, God, this guy is talented. I hired him on the spot. Then my friend called me and he said, what's up with hiring Saul? You know, I wanted you to talk to him. I said, you know, Saul didn't want to talk. Saul wanted a job. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the fact that he worked for five years and you didn't realize that he was talented or you didn't see him in that role, I did. So I hired him. Like, Saul didn't want to talk. He wanted a job. And so those are the kinds of things. And candidly, a lot of my diverse my diverse employees come from, you know, believe it or not, there is a, a, a woman CEO who said, well, I've got this person who heads research, she wants to do acquisitions, and her exact quote was, and the guys didn't think she could interact with the brokers. And I'm like, okay. Met her, incredibly bright, offered her a job immediately, and because at the end of the day, if you have money, the brokers, you can interact with them. <laughs> and so I think we try to overcomplicate it, and but part of it, it starts with, in across the, the, the industry, there are very few, you know, I mean, young talent, when they come in, and, and why a lot of them go to the tech industry, they want to see people that may look like them that are not all of the same, um, you know, ethnicity or gender. And they want to see diversity, and they, so many are attracted to our company because we are diverse. And I think that is one of the challenges, particularly with the entry level people, because you know they have a lot of choices, and you know they want to go somewhere where they feel as if they can grow. Yeah. Do either of you oh, want to no, jump no. in? Oh. Yeah. I, you know, I was going to say too. I think I think to the point of you know, I growing up, I didn't even know that there was a career to be had in real estate. Um, and, you know, I come from a long line of teachers and I thought I'm, I'm going to be a teacher. That, that was my, my career goal. And, and I actually was a teacher for a couple of years. And so I ended up falling into real estate. Um, and when I decided that that was, that was my career that I wanted to pursue, I, I went back to business school. And literally there were, I was the only African American woman in the real estate program, and there was one African American male in the real estate program. And to this day, those numbers still stick. And so, you know, when you, as I, you know, as I'm starting to interview people for positions and I'm looking at the resumes that come in, there are a lot of, of uh, white males that come in with real estate experience. And there are a few, you know, very few um, minority candidates um, come, you know, posting for positions or making it through the phone screenings. And so, you know, I find that very interesting. And, you know, I've challenged our company to look in other places, um, you know, to recruit, right? Like, you know, we're in New York City, so NYU and Columbia are great schools, but there are other, other schools, um, historically black colleges and universities that we should also be reaching out to to find candidates. And so, you know, I think that's just, that's, you know, that's one issue. And I, I find it amazing that a lot of the resumes we have, like I'm, I'm, these kids are coming out of high school and they're undergrad with like significant real estate experience. And when you look at our minority candidates, they have no experience, but we have to look at how talented they are, to your point, Daryl, about Saul, um, you know, we have to look for talented individuals. And I think if that's, if we're setting the bar there, then we're missing out on some, on some great people. So I come from this from the funder side. Um, and so what we see is a lack of talent in every space. So we see a, a, a lack of talent. Um, and when I mean lack of talent, I mean a lack of available talent because we're not doing our job to reach out to the talent that exists. So as foundations, we're very close-knit entities, and so we get referrals from friends, we get referrals from colleagues, but we are not reaching out and going out to the HBCUs, for example. Like, we have a, a strong HBCU um, and in Baltimore, actually two, in Morgan State and Coppin State University, and we don't actively recruit from those schools as a, as a foundation, right? So we, we don't do enough in terms of our outreach and recruiting 
to really, really bring and diversify the talent pool. So that's one thing. The second thing I would talk about is, as philanthropic capital, we're probably the most patient capital. We don't provide enough to entities, especially developers of color, to allow them to develop talent. So we provide our capital so they can go build units. But we don't buy, give them capital to actually develop their organization. And so we see a lot of that playing out um, in, in the funding space. Can I, can I just piggyback? Because yep. I think there's, there, there are two things. One is in, when we were doing our initial call, Daryl and Pam, you guys said something that changed my thinking, which was, and it had to do with the resume thing you were talking about. We are, you know, real estate is so specific in terms of this guy's an asset manager, this guy's an acquisitions. And what Daryl said, which, and I want, I want to make sure it gets out here because it was so important, is we have to, when you see something, when you see the talent, you can't just focus on, oh, he's only been doing asset, or she's only been doing asset management for 10 years, so she's not going to be a good acquisitions person. Um, we have to look past that if we're serious about sort of changing the diversity and changing the talent pool that we have to suck from. And I think that the, I never really thought about that. I, so many times I would just say, oh, this, this, this guy just isn't the right guy. He hasn't done enough deals. Um, and um, we have to reach beyond that. It takes a little bit of risk, but you got to be able to do it. And I think that's critical. Um, and then the, I wanted to piggyback on the HBCU thing. Um, I was uh, on a panel recently for the International Council of Shopping Centers, um, and we were talking about institutional, um, you know, real estate investment. And I was surprised that an entire segment was just about diversity and how do we increase diversity. Um, and um, there seems to be, you know, this conversation I think is going to places other than, you know, obviously, uh, you know, obviously this whole. This whole uh, 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 conference is about the, the intersection of you know social ideas and capital, but this was just about money. Um, this is just about how do we good, do good deals, and it was interesting that that comment about hey we need to have diversity of thought so we understand the investments we're making it came up, and it didn't come from a black person because I was the only black person there and it wasn't my idea, um, and uh, they brought it up and then they. They explained to me, which I think is awesome in their ways that we should be able to piggyback on this, that they have now formed a relationship with Florida A&M University where they are actively recruiting uh, and trying to suck people into the real estate programs and get them trained up so that they can come work for folks like you. So I think that I, I, I was, number one, I just wanted to make sure that you know, I piggybacked and brought that out because it, it really did change my thinking and I think that's super valuable and I want more people to hear that. And number two, it's great that people are now focusing on trying to create these relationships with HBCUs and trying to figure out how we can draw some of this talent into real estate. And just to add on to that, I think you're starting to see more conversations like the one we're having at Casey about how do we support our investees to be able to recruit. Um, so we can provide grant capital, for example, for internship programs, like we can provide more patient capital so you can actually build up your talent pool so they can actually make you money after about two or three years. Because the first year analyst, a lot of times, it's a loss, right? If you think about your, your balance sheet. So we are really trying to figure out ways, how do we support our investees um, through our, our capital deployment? Great, thanks. Uh, a bunch of things there that we could go off on. Uh, I wanted to uh, stay with the HBCU conversation quickly just because one of the things that I, I did in doing my research for this uh, panel discovered is that none of the biggest 20 HBCUs offer a master's in real estate currently, which was surprising to me um, and maybe wouldn't be surprising given what we're talking about here, but that feels like to me like a place where maybe the, the talent pipeline could connect even more directly because like you were saying, David, those, those masters, those MBA jobs are the ones that really help you elevate yourself in the, in the industry. Um, and Daryl, I want to pick up on something you said, which is you know, this, this question about uh, your, your CEO friends who can't see certain people in positions. You know, what, candidly, is preventing them from doing that? Is it a failure of imagination? Is it explicit bias or implicit bias? Um, you know, is it their life experience? Like, how would you sort of characterize that? And, and then, having characterized it, how do you address it? How do we fix it? Because we can't put you in charge of every single real estate uh, you know, company out there, unfortunately. 
You know, I, I would actually cha challenge some of the premise. I'm not sure it's always even race. I think that the real estate industry, there's a structural aspect of you know, people who do acquisitions, well, I need to find someone who does acquisitions. And, you know, because I just uh, unfortunately our head of, of uh, acquisitions just uh, took another job who was someone who was in the closing area at my other company who we trained and, and mentored to, to do acquisitions. And actually I went to him and I said, you know, I, one of, we're vertically integrated, so we do on-site property management. And, you know, one of our property managers, who's an African-American woman who runs a $50 million asset, uh, I said, you know, I think, she, you know, she'd be great in, in acquisitions. And he said, well, she's not done acquisitions. And I said, she runs a $50 million investment. She knows something because we've just entrusted her with that. And I think part of the in, is an industry issue is that we look at, you know, people in, in certain stereo, in s s silos and we stereotype. And I think it's important that, you know, w you know that's part of it. The other part is, um, you know, just when you go to, you know, uh, I mean, I was on a corporate board where the acquisitions team was run by a gentleman who had been at CBRE. He, who was white, who had 10 other white males who all had been at CBRE. And I said, um, do you think you might at least get someone from Grubb and Ellis? <laughs> or at least some level of diversity? And, you know, and he said, well, these are people I feel comfortable with. And that's one of the things that we have to, to get out of is just what, you know, comfort levels. And, you know, I would say that some of our best hires have been people who are diametrically opposed to, you know, everything that we do. But they have great ideas and they, they do it in a respectful way. But you want to have, you want to have people pushing back, you know, because you don't want to build clones of organizations. But, you know, I just think that part of it is industry where people, you know, you go to a PREA, which is Pension Real Estate Association. Amazingly, there's a lot of diversity amongst people and client services that are calling on public pension funds. There are a lot of people of color, a lot of women. But the wealth creation in these companies are in the acquisitions and portfolio management. You look over there, all white males. And so part of it is just looking at the in industry in a way that you, we take people and you know, talented people can do a lot of things. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big su subscriber of the best available athlete, of get, you know, getting talented people, and talented people can do a lot of things. Does anyone want to add to that, or uh, should I move on? No, I mean, you know what, as a, as a real life example, I had a woman uh, who mentored, I, I came out of CBRE, <laughs> so I understand the, uh, not the lack of diversity uh, there, and that was 20 years ago. Um, but I, there was a woman who mentored me and said, and, and I'm in acquisitions, and I've always been in acquisitions. She said, never go to asset management, because when you go to asset management, you will never make your way back to acquisitions. And so that is that is the silo effect. And it, it is a very industry-specific um, issue that we have. Um, but, I, you know, I also think that um, beyond that, you know, Real estate also is a relationship business, and you know, and and what I've seen over the years is people hire their friends and family, and you know that's 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 really an underlying aspect of it. And so, who 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 has that hiring power certainly makes a big difference. Like, how did our president get our his first job? <laughs> <laughs> I think he did have some kind of connection. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, and, and I, Pam, you mentioned something that was interesting, which is that you said you're seeing resumes of people who are accumulating real estate experience during high school and college. And co the, the, who are these people? How are they getting? I mean, I certainly didn't do that. Um, and 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 do you feel like that is that is also because of family connections? They're working in like their their family's business it and is. getting that. When you dig yeah. in and you ha and and you actually have the interview and you ask the question, how did you get this experience? And they'll say, oh, my dad 
you know, my dad knew this, this person and, and, you know, I interned at, at their company. And that, I hear that a lot. I mean, it's, you know, it's not just one or two examples. I hear that a lot. And they come with major experience. It's amazing. Mm, it happens to me all the time. I get a call from an investor or a friend saying, hey, my son or my daughter needs some experience. Will you take them for the summer? Next thing you know, they have a $50 million deal on their resume. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what happens. Real estate is so relationship driven, as we all know. That's how deals happen. Um, and so that, that doesn't shock me. Um, it happens all the time. The only thing that, you know, I think that we have to do is, is you know, is as, as folks who can make that happen, is be intentional about trying to get our friends who, who may not understand that their daughter could do this to say, hey, why don't you send her to me for the summer? Because um, we can make, I mean, if I want an intern, I make an intern, right? It's, it's that simple. I don't have a big corporate infrastructure I have to, that I have to turn around to do an internship. But, you know, so, you know, I have done that. I've, you know, I've called a friend who's a broker and said, hey, I'd like you to take, you know, these three kids and I'll pay for them for the summer so that, you know, they can get some exposure to the business. So we, you, we actually have to try to do it. Otherwise, it just, it's sort of, it just won't happen by osmosis, I think, is part of the, part of the challenge that we have. Great. Um, so what, uh, pulling out of, and, and I appreciate, uh, you know, your willingness, David and Daryl in particular, to sort of think about what the, what you ought to be doing with your own companies, your own businesses. And I actually, I read uh, that what Jonathan Rose did with his firm is he created a committee uh, for hiring talent that had diversity as one of its primary goals, and he withdrew himself from the committee. So when he gets those calls from friends, he just says, I'm not on the committee, so I can't actually influence who we're hiring at all. Sorry, submit the application. Um, and you know, that, that is his at least one step he's taken, I think, to try to find a broader pool. Um, but I'm wondering what, from, you know, from my standpoint and, and Pam, from your standpoint, we as uh, asset managers and buyers um, and institutional allocators could be doing. You know, what's, what should be the burden and ask of us to you know, change the industry? What's appropriate and what do you think could work? So um, because we're on the impact team, we look at a lot of different metrics when we invest in fund managers. We do not have a formal emerging manager program. I wish we did and I applaud the companies that actually do have those. I think there are some great finds and candidates that have come out of those programs. But um, what we do is measure diversity within companies and not just diversity among the entire company, but diversity amongst the C-suite and, and you know the senior leadership team. And we ask, and Daryl knows this because he gets this questionnaire from us every year, is how diverse is your senior leadership team? And every year we, 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 you know, we attend the, the meetings and we raise our hands and say, you know, what are you doing about diversity? Um, within your company because not only are we just investing in your fund because we like the returns or we like the strategy, but we also want to invest in diverse companies. Um, and that's, you know, we're, we're an impact team and that, that's one of our measurements is, you know, gender and diversity. And so, you know, we invest with Jonathan and I raise my hand every year and say, what are we doing about diversity? So um, it's, it's the forefront and um, we, are, we are seeing change because we asked that question. Have and you ever not we, done a deal because you didn't like the answer to that question? Um, we, no, because we do seek it out and we have to present that as part of our, our committee. So it, it never makes it, you know, it wouldn't make it that far. It wouldn't get to the point of investment committee, but, right. you know, do you, do you ever sit down for an initial meeting and sort of get the sense that this, this isn't going to go anywhere because the firm isn't thinking about I, I can. I way. will tell you this. I, we did, um, we did invest in a, a new fund manager um, earlier this year that had very little diversity on their team. And I said, your next hires you need to look for diverse candidates. And within three months after we made the investment, he hired two minority. They uh, listen. Yeah, yeah, so they listen. That money talks. And, and, it, and it matters. Mm -hmm. Money talks. <laughs> you know, I would just like to highlight the, 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 the two, uh, Ruben and Pam on this panel of their companies. And, and those are two companies, and they were uh, both our first investors, two of our first investors in this company, in our first fund. Hardest thing to do is to raise, 
you know, it's an amazing thing. You know, we built, I built an incredible track record in the first company. We had built, you know, three, four billion dollars of assets under management. When I sold my interest and then started over, everyone thought I was an idiot again. And so getting that first time investor, but both of those companies, Prudential and Nuveen, uh, it starts with they're very diverse at the highest level. Uh, I've made presentations to Prudential's board. I can tell you there's a thoughtfulness about not only um, diversity, but how you invest. I, I am always amazed when if anyone has the opportunity, and uh, I, a couple of your colleagues, Ruben, took me, I mean, if, if anyone doesn't realize, Newark, New Jersey was a dead city 10, 15 years ago. And despite what anyone says of the mayor or Cory Booker or anything, Prudential's investment in that city, particularly downtown, was transformative. And I've taken a walk with some of your colleagues around downtown Newark, and it's amazing what has happened. And that just shows a company who's doing the right things. Uh, and I think long term, those investments will be very, very profitable. And, and the same thing with uh, Nuveen. And, and so, you know, there is a reason why, those, why your companies are successful. It starts at that uh, diversity and a commitment to doing what's right. And I applaud both of you for that. Thank you. I mean, I, you know, I think we take it seriously. And, and at Prudential, actually, we just this year from our group and from PGM Real Estate uh, started something called the Diverse Partners Initiative, where we're really looking to, you know, measure uh, allocation of both capital and deal flow to diverse teams and setting concrete goals for achievement over the next few years in order to make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable that way, which, you know, feels kind of it's brave because we could fail. Um, you know, but I think it's going to be necessary to make sure that you actually get the results you want. I think that I just want to, that whole money talks thing, that's real. Um, and um, the, the reality is that we're seeing this now from our, almost all of our institutional investors. And I believe it's because of the lead you guys have been taking in this space. They are now questioning and asking, not just, it's interesting, not just as you said, uh, who's diverse, who's on the management team. They, they also want to know who we're doing business with. Um, who are the contracts going to? Are you including, um, are you giving opportunities for minority firms to bid on this business? Are you finding places for women-owned businesses? And that push has got to keep coming from the money. If it comes from the money, people will respond, um, whether they're, you know, some of them will respond because they'll say, oh, that's the right thing to do. Um, and others will be like, hey, I need this money, so I'm going to do, do what I have to do, which is no different than, you know, uh, you know, a rich investor calling you up and saying, take my son as an internship. There's no difference between that. Um, well, actually, there is a difference. One has a, a good social purpose. <laughs> but, but in I'd other like words, think there's in, terms of, in terms of the pressure it puts on people to, to move in the right direction, I think it's critical. And I really applaud what you're doing, and, and thank you for that. Oh, thank you. You know, I just want to touch on that that point. Um, you know, and you say, what are the business reasons? We, in turn, are, you know, diversity is very important to us. A uh, very good friend of mine who is African-American, is one of the largest general contractors in Southern California, is doing all the work at, at LAX and the new stadium. Uh, we were doing a significant re renovation, 528 apartments, in Long Beach, California, and he said, you know, I have this incredibly talented um, Hispanic um, painter that could do your job, but they don't have, the way the airport pays, they have the ability to structure the payments because they don't have that much bonding capacity, but for your job, they don't have the, they, they need probably a two to three million dollar line of credit. And so we actually went to, and I saw their work, and met them and incredibly talented and we we did two things one is we went to one of our banks and said you know and they're always trying to a number of our banks wells fargo key bank and others are always trying to do more in the community so we we set up this person to meet one of our bankers they got the line of credit and that was one thing but the second is we said if you can do this job we got four more for you to do 
And so then, you know, they have just performed amazingly. And, and in today's world, when it's very difficult to get people the trades because they're so busy, uh, this gentleman will not take a new job without calling me first to make sure that I didn't need him. You know, if, if I needed him, he would, you know. Uh, so we've built a relationship there where, you know, the, the, someone is executed, but we've created a partnership with someone where we are their priority. And that's a great benefit uh, to us. So I just want to add a, a couple of things from, again, from the, the funder impact investor perspective. Um, so we typically are going to focus not on the units being developed, but the enterprise that we're investing in. And so, so in doing that, we take a much more systems change approach. And so it's beyond just our capital. So as, as a large foundation, we could focus on policy. We could focus on advocacy. We could focus on providing um, subsidy capital. We can do a lot of things to be like strong partners um, with the asset managers as they're developing units. Um, especially for us, we get to ask all of the tough questions. Um, and they have to answer to us all the time. Ruben knows now um, from the work that we're doing with them that he probably will talk about shortly. Um, so, so for us, um, we try to be drivers of change, both at, at the enterprise level and the systems level to make the environment more fertile for diversity within real estate. Great, thank you. I mean, I, uh, and, and James, it's true, we, we have a partnership with the Casey. I didn't want this to be too much bragging about Prudential, and I appreciate all the complimentary comments. You invited us. I, <laughs> I did, I did, but I, I consider that a, more of a, a favor. I, I, didn't, and I, didn't, I didn't invite you here to hear me talk about how great my employer is. That feels weird. Um, no, but, but, we, but we, did, we did form a partnership with the Kresge and Casey Foundations uh, to directly try to use our dollars and their guarantee capacity to close the racial wealth gap. And, um, you know, and on the real estate side, we are out there looking for partners of color who may lack capital um, and have a great deal and are looking for a source of capital that is coming, uh, coming to them and, and trying to find them and support them and grow their business. And so, and, and we're also investing in closing the racial wealth gap in other ways as well, in other sectors. Um, and using that partnership, I, I hope to um, strike the right tone. I mean, I, you know, it's not enough money to do the job on its own. The, the job is a trillion dollar job, a multi-trillion dollar job. The idea, I think, speaking for myself and, and Pam, I've heard you say this too, you know, the idea is to set the best example and, and make others follow. Maybe, David, you, you, you've seen it, making other people follow that example. Um, and if we're doing that, great. That's, that's how you get the trillion dollar change. We can, you know, we can start with the millions. Um, I want to pause just uh, and, and give a chance if people in the audience have questions. We've got, I think, maybe 15 minutes or so left. So if people do, I want to make sure we get those in. Um, so. There's a microphone if uh, coming to you. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, this conversation is very much so timely and apropos and very uh, sensitive to and near and dear to my heart being a former member of the commercial real estate sector. As you know, with any organization, real estate being no different, uh, individuals typically recruited by an individual, but the culture is what helps them stay. Is there anything that's being uniquely done or can be uniquely done at some of the larger commercial real estate firms different and apart from the typical employee research group model, which most larger companies have. But as you said earlier, um, real estate is so uniquely driven by relationships in terms of you being able to propel your career from one level to the next. Is there anything that can be uniquely done or is being uniquely done at some of these larger institutions, either at your firms or others that you're aware of, that can help ensure that people of color can stay in these positions, but also grow and develop. And Mr. Carter, it'd be great if you can give a little profile on Reese, which you and I talked about a little earlier. Well, maybe. <laughs> oh. Does anyone want to talk to the, well, speak to the culture to issue? The culture issue, maybe. The culture issue? Large institutions. <laughs> we're, talking, we're talking about moving deals off the golf course and into someplace else, right? I mean, starting with sort of that kind of a perspective. Well, I, I, I'm on the outside, and I raise money from institutions. The, from what I see, there's nothing. There's literally nothing. At most of the investment partners we have, um, I have, there's maybe one female, um, one or two females. Uh, I, across all of these organizations, 
Um, I only do, there's only two senior black professionals making decisions, and there's no one beneath them. If they do start, you will see an analyst or two pop up, then they tend to fall off. I don't know what's going on inside. Um, some of them I know are working on it. They have this idea that they're going to do something about it. But from the outside looking in, there doesn't seem to be a strat in, there don't seem to be hard strategies, um, you know, um, other than, you know, so it's, 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 it's hard to see from the outside. Um. You know, we, we um, the, the organization that, he, um, that he's referencing, the Real Estate Executive Council, was something that uh, my former partner and a good friend created probably 13, 14 years ago that brought um, real estate professional senior uh, professionals, but also, you know, people starting companies together to try to facilitate transactional flow. And we just had our conference about uh, two weeks ago, and there were about 120 people there. You know, the, the real interesting question is, and, and it's one that um, a good friend of mine who many of you may know, Victor McFarlane, who's based up here, McFarlane Partners, uh, Victor was honored by uh, USC a couple of months ago, and I bought a table, and I invited my old partner and a, a few other uh, African Americans who had started businesses in the 90s, uh, uh, Richmond McCoy, if you know him. And one of the questions we ask that night, which is a very, very interesting question, we all started late 80s, early 90s. Is it, was it harder then, or is it harder today? And I'm going to tell you, I went back and forth in my head a lot. And I actually concluded, in some respects, which it shouldn't be, it's probably harder today for one reason. And that is that institutions, there's been this huge consolidation where, you know, back when we started Capri Capital in 1991, maybe you had a company like um, Reef that had maybe $4 billion of assets under management. But today you've got Blackstone announcing a $20 billion real estate fund. There's been so much consolidation in the industry and where we are left with, we have a barbell. On one side, we have, you know, the, these huge companies, you know, uh, JP Morgan, Blackstone, on that end, and that's where most of the capital is allocated. On the other end are companies that have very niche strategies that are able to execute and provide alpha. And you've gotta be on one end or the other. And so, you know, and, and the reality is, I mean, with, with, with many institutional investors, you know, you don't get fired allocating money to Blackstone. I mean, you, you, know, you just simply don't. And so there's a risk element there, mm -hmm. and, you know, which is a commendable with companies like Nuveen and Prudential that they do look and they make those investments in companies like ours. Um, so th that's one of the challenges, just the general structure, the consolidation of financial assets over time, the same way in stocks and bonds and the like. Hi, everyone. I have a question. My name is Bree Jones. Um, I'm from Baltimore, so it's really exciting to see Baltimore repping in all the way out here in San Francisco and looking forward to our meeting later today. Um, so I am the founder of Parity. Parity is an, well, I call myself an equitable developer. Um, I am working on closing the wealth disparity by renovating uh, abandoned buildings in Baltimore to create affordable homeownership opportunities centering black, black and brown people. Um, and so my question is, um, when it comes to kind of increasing diversity in the real estate space, um, we've talked a little bit about hiring at the institutional level and you know, top-down approaches to diversity. Do you guys do any mentorship or incubation of new developers like myself? And I ask that because um, I meet a lot of white men in this field who are oftentimes more than happy to take me under their wing and show me the ropes and sit on my board, you know, the Jubilees of the world or the Southwest Partnerships of the world. Um, but sometimes, you know, when I meet 
black folks in the industry, it's a little bit you know, more difficult. And so I just um, am curious what you guys do on a personal level to show the ropes to people coming up you know, behind you. And I'll put it out, out there. I am recruiting for my board. And so if anyone is interested in taking a board position, um, I'm, I'm available, so thank you. Yes, preferably you guys, but any, also in your organization. Well, I would comment first that it's great that you've attracted mentorship of any, you know, of someone who is qualified in, in, in the industry. You know, we take on, we probably have um, seven ventures with smaller minority developers, uh, one of which uh, is, a, is a very incredibly talented African-American woman in Charlotte. I think you met... Um, uh, Dion Nelson, whose company they've developed 25 affordable uh, communities. So we're in partnership with 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 her, her company. Uh, so it's something that we do, and part of it it ex expands our capacity in markets that maybe like we have a, a, a property in in um, the Raleigh Durham area. We we don't have you know she has great resources there, and rather than us build them there, we'd rather partner with her. And so yes, we do that. And, uh, but more importantly, I think it's, you know, we, we look also, you know, we partner with community organizations. I mean, you know, half of our residents are Section 8 voucher holders. And, you know, despite whatever you hear out of Washington, you know, they all work. I mean, 96% of them work. A third of them are two incomes. And what it means is that many of our family communities, you know, kids come home from school to empty households. And so we've partnered with community organizations and nonprofits to do after school programs in a lot of our communities. So our view is our investment strategy is not just brick and mortar, it's very holistic and inclusive. Um, we, uh, we have done that. I think the issue for us has to do with scale. Um, we can't invest in small deals because just the size of our organization and where we are, so that becomes a challenge. I think you and I have actually even spoken, um, and you're not you're not from Baltimore, but you moved to Baltimore to help. And for those of you who are not from Baltimore, we want anyone who's interested in coming to Baltimore who wants to invest. We want you to come on come on down. I think you're, uh, but uh, but I think so. We have done that with larger scale projects. We do something we call we call it a co GP. So you'll get someone who has an interesting project with some scale to it, but doesn't have the ability to, because the institutions will provide equity, but they won't guarantee debt or guarantee com completion costs typically. So the sponsor has to provide that. And then the institutions also want to know that there's a platform. So with smaller developers, um, you know, and not just all minorities with uh, with everyone we've done this co GP format where you come in with the project we we put up the sponsor equity and then we'll bring one of our larger limited partners in to, to get the deal done so for us um, as, a, as a funder and impact investor we are actually looking at strategies to support um, smaller developers so one of our initial investments was in the Harbor Bank CDC program the main reason we did it oh for those in Harbor Bank of Maryland is the black owned bank in, in, in Baltimore um, the reason why we um, elected to do that because of their emerging developer program. So we put capital in, in partnership with J.P. Morgan Chase to support that effort. Um, in my previous role at the Kellogg Foundation, we we invested in Capital Impact Partners, um, a strong CDFI. Um, they have a developers program both in Detroit and thinking also in California and Oakland as well. And so, um, in my role, I'm always looking for strategies to try to support um, developers of color um, and through our investment strategies. I talk to people all the time, so we can chat, and I, um, you know, I can c consult and mentor. I'm happy to do that. I do that all the time. I, I help people. Call me, people call me all the time about term sheets and what are the right terms. And I'm, you know, looking to work with this institutional partner, and so um, I'm, I'm happy to chat. Hi, I'm Lori Gibbs Harris, and I spent uh, probably 25, almost 30 years at uh, in commercial real estate, Northwestern Mutual, Travelers, Equitable, um, on the transaction side, as opposed to in asset management, and came in um, really um, thinking that 
loving real estate, what's not to love, loving commercial real estate. And I'm, this, is, this is sort of just a, uh, I've been out of real estate now, commercial real estate for 10 years, and I'll get to that. But structurally, the lack of mentorship internally, the lack of support and cultivation, the way, um, and, and I'm Daryl's generation, so black developers were just beginning, and that was a natural, uh, a more natural progression for blacks who were interested in commercial real estate was to go into affordable housing development because Prudential, Travelers, Northwestern, the, the Mass Mutual weren't as friendly or didn't have black folks there. And then when we were there, we were not cultivated. We were basically, um, you know who got the big portfolios, who when somebody with through attrition, how portfolios were handed down. I would say the saving grace for me was my confidence, but also I had the money. So yes, I have the power to call up anybody I want because as a lender, I've got the money and um, there's equal opportunity to that extent that you're willing to leverage the fact that you have money, that you represent the money. Uh, but that doesn't negate the fact that it is something of a closed system. The guys all talk to each other. The mortgage break, bro bankers bring their deals to the guy who has done the most deals because that's who's going to get their deal done. So um, spent a lot, 30 years in, in that industry. Um, would love to talk about connections with uh, the historically black colleges and cultivating a track for uh, the institutional side of commercial real estate and uh, not asset management. I'm sorry. I I think that being on the transactional side is the lucrative side. That's where you get paid. Um, there is a consequence of all of this consolidation in commercial real estate and the development and the rampant development, and that's the field that I've moved into, is the displacement and the lack of reinvestment of capital uh, of jobs, of resources back into our communities as a result uh, of the uh, really aggressive development and of communities like Oakland, San Francisco. Um, at Northwestern, I spearheaded uh, an, uh, a socially responsible initiative. And so I know that there, within the insurance companies, there is money for doing something other than new market tax credit deals. And so how can those of us who are trying to uh, uplift entrepreneurship actually start to access that some of that huge amounts of capital that is embedded in the real estate industry that cities like Oakland have you know, made concessions for your to bring the development in, whether it's retail entrepreneur development, whether it's um, mostly right. I'm interested in the entrepreneur development. So I wanted to state my bona fides with respect to the industry, but now I'm advocating and asking how, do, how does the industry, particularly the institutional side, start to give some money back to the community? I would just start off with, um, you know, that capital attracts I mean, number one, there's a ton of capital out there. And sometimes we get, you know, we, we think that when a couple of doors aren't open that there isn't. But there is a lot of capital out there. And one of the things that I have found today <clears throat> as part of us attracting capital, believe it or not, the biggest thing that um, institutional investors, I mean, certainly the quality of the projects and the team, but building the back room in the compliance area is huge. You know, um, both um, Ruben and Pam are in the impact space. We do a lot of reporting on things. Our reporting regimen is intense. And we really built our back, you know, I've, I've learned from building one company and starting the second, the most important thing in attracting capital is the back room. I mean, at the end of the day, I always like to say, you know, I always wanted to go into a meeting and say, look, we're no smarter or 
than anyone else. We're going to generate market returns, and we're not going to steal the money. I mean, I'd always <laughs> like to say that, but we never do that. But the point is, having a robust back room and building the compliance aspect is the most important in, in terms of attracting capital. And the one thing I would say is, recently, about three years ago, because it was so hard raising money here, we decided to go and potentially raise money in Europe. And I would our latest fund, which will be around $600 million, we will have a third of the capital from European investors. One of the things that we learned about European investors when it talks about affordable and workforce housing, you know, they are huge investors of that in, in countries like Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Denmark, the UK. And so they don't necessarily, I mean, candidly, US investors, when you say Section 8 housing, they run away. And, you know, I remember going to one investor in an unnamed city. I don't want to offend anyone, but it's a state capital somewhere in the Midwest. And they were saying, well, you know, after we made, this is probably a $50 billion pension fund. And they said, well, we don't want to invest in any of that. That's yucky. And it was like, have you seen this city <laughs> and all the mobile home parks that are falling apart? Nothing looks like that that we invest in. But the point is this, that there is lots of capital out there, but increasingly today, the compliance, and, the, and it's probably the hardest thing about the financial, uh, you know, a lot of the things after the downturn is that, you know, things like Dodd-Frank, the Volcker Rule, we've had to learn to navigate them. Probably more important to navigate that today than the actual investment side. So I would just say keep patient. There's lots of capital out there, but just you have to be structured to, you know, to, to com to, to, to manage all the compliance and reporting. I'm, I, I just want to say one of the real, one of the difficult things is the deals are really hard. I mean, I, and we have to, you know, deals are hard when you're trying to do impact deals in impacted communities because the math doesn't always work out. Um, when you're doing affordable housing, there's lots of pathways to the financing. It's a very sort of, oh, I got this, I got this, I can put these things together, here's the capital stack. But if you're trying to do other kinds of projects, it is extremely difficult. And it's not for the faint of heart. And it takes a long time and a ton of capital. And, you know, the idea that you could, you know, that we, that you're going to be able to do it without pulling together lots of different capital. And I think you I'm, I'm, I see you nodding because I think you understand what I'm talking about. The deals we want to do, the deals that are going to be the most impactful in our communities, the math doesn't work without something else. So you need an investor who has an impact point of view, who's willing to say, okay, for this particular transaction, I see that you're, you're going to bring jobs or whatever the, the situation is to this area, and we're willing to sort of look past the 16 IRR we typically want for development, and we'll take a lower yield because we believe in what you're doing. And the challenge with that is, there, you know, <clears throat> there, there's a bunch of challenges. One is you have to, you know, when you show up and you say, hey, I want to do this $20 million deal, you know, you have to be set up to do a $20 million deal. So they want to see, show me, and even impact investors, I mean, you know, they're not just going to, oh, it's a good deal, but who's the operator? Where's your accounting? How does this work? How does that work? So, so we have these structural challenges of a very hard deal, and then you have to have a company with enough of a track record and back office and all the other pieces who, they, who the investors believe, not that you'll steal the money, but that you... Right, exactly, that you won't lose the money or the deal. But the reality is, and I think it's important for everyone in this room to realize, is that if you can't figure out how to math, make the math work, none of these deals will happen. The math has to work. And you've got to be able to get some money from Casey and cobble it together with the money from this and the money from that, some new markets tax credits and all that. If you're not doing affordable housing, which I think has a has a very clear pathway to financing most of the time. Um, and you're talking about mixed use or anything, office or retail or medical or anything like that. It is hard and time consuming. It takes a lot of upfront capital before the deal's even ready to accept capital from, from another investor. And that's the reality of it. But it's super important. 
And if you have the fortitude and you're willing to do it, there are definitely ways to pull it together. And it can be done. And when you're finished and you look up, you're like, holy crap, we actually changed this whole area. Um, and that's totally doable. Okay. Yeah, Pam, you want to go ahead and... Yeah, I, I, assume, I assume you were going to say that you have similar limitations that we do in that, you know, it's... I actually, I seek relationships with, um, with local developers and partners. Um, we want to grow them. We have a limitation on the minimum capital that we can put out, which is $10 million. And so when you're, when you're looking at that number and you're working with an entrepreneur or, or a, new, a newer developer, they need $2 million in equity or $3 million in equity. I can't do that deal because it takes me as much time and effort to put, to into, you know, to put out $10 million as it does $3 million. The next thing I look at is pipeline. How much pipeline are you going to, I have to put out capital. I get a capital allocation. You know, it's a good problem to have. <laughs> I get a capital allocation every year. That money has to go out. And so when I look at, you know, should I do, even should I do a $10 million deal or this $25 million deal, the $25 million deal is normally the one that that I, I'll work on, and so you know I and look that's for twenty five million of equity, equity yeah. and equity, and that's that's the, that's the issue, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So so I need someone with a pipeline, and if I can prove out a pipeline, then I will do a smaller deal. If if we can say, you know, um, the the other the other issue that we run into in looking for partners is even in the affordable housing sector. And by the way, we believe impact does drives value that we don't have to give up return for that. But the other thing that we look for is you know are they aligned with our mission and so you know when I talk to Daryl about you know investing in his fund he says the right things to me I don't know what you say to the other investors I assume it's the same but you know he's, he, he talks about the mission and we're mission based and sometimes with the early developers they're just focused on the return and the and the deal so much that I can't even get to are we really aligned in our mission for even in affordable housing where you think like there's natural impact they're still focused on return and capital, and it, and it doesn't come across for us in the right way. Yeah, I'll, I'll only add to that, and I think we have to wrap up, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I would just say one of the things that helps me get into a relationship with a new development partner, a new entity uh, that I've never worked with before, is someone who can serve as a strong local reference that they can point me to. So, you know, as you're building that business, you're, you should be figuring out who are the people in your market, even if they're just, you know, if they're mortgage lenders or they're brokers who work for large brokerages, those kinds of people who, from a relationship standpoint, can speak credibly about your abilities and get to know you before you have to introduce yourself to me. Because like Pam, I'm going to give you, you know, I'll give you an hour of my time for an initial call and maybe I'll spend a few hours following up to figure out whether or not the deal works. And then that's it. Then I've got to move on. I've got to do something else if it's not going to work. And so the quicker you can point me to, to someone who can say, oh, yeah, you know, so-and-so has been here in you know, Memphis or San Antonio or wherever for the last 10 years. And, yeah, I realize this is a step forward for them, but they, they seem like they're ready to do that. They're credible. They're honest. They're not going to steal the money. You know, <laughs> that... That, that, real, that does really help. I mean, and, and uh, you know, in, insofar as this is a relationship business, like if you've got a relationship you can put on the table, that's great. And, you know, my challenge, of course, is to people who are doing economic development locally, like figure out how to give those relationships to people, like bring those people into that community of, of conversation so that, so that Prudential, who doesn't know them from Adam, can, can have that discussion. Um, well, speaking of having discussions, this was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please join me in thanking the panel. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so all so much for your time.